So let me welcome everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the participants of this Zoom call to what we have billed as cocktails <laughs> and conversation leading into the airing of the final episode of The Plot Against America. I'm welcoming you on behalf of the Newark Public Library Board of Trustees, on behalf of the Newark Public Library Foundation Board, and on behalf of the staff of the Newark Public Library. I am Rosemary Steinbaum. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees and I'm the chair of the foundation. We have on this program, on this Zoom program, over 100 participants from throughout the country. And our most immediate wish from all of us on our end in Newark to all of you throughout the country is for your continued safety and good health for you, for your families, and for the people who you care about. I'd like to speak for a moment about the Newark Public Library and the services and the programs that the library has been able to continue to provide in the context of the coronavirus epidemic. There are social workers, census advisors, story times, book groups, and much, much more. And this is the moment to thank the extraordinary staff under the leadership of Tom Allroots, who is the interim library director. And I'm going to take a moment to thank Kirsten Giardi, our development director, and Diego Quintero, an IT guru, our IT guru, for assisting with this program. This forum is an example of the kind of programming that we will be able to offer under the umbrella of the Philip Roth Personal Library. Philip Roth had a long, meaningful relationship with the Newark Public Library. It began in his boyhood when, as he wrote and said, he grew up in a household without money for books. So he got on his bike and he rode to the Osborne Terrace branch of the Newark Public Library where he could find what he wanted and bring home baskets full of books. From that moment to the research that he did for his so-called American trilogy, including American Pastoral, when he used the Newark Public Library and its many resources as research for his marvelous books, and I hope many of you had ha have had the opportunity to read them. Uh, all of that culminated with generous gifts to the Newark Public Library, and those gifts are highlighted by his gift of the contents of his personal library. But what is the Philip Roth Personal Library? It's much more than books. It's books, but it's also Roth's marginalia. And his marginalia contain his reactions, no, no way, to his thoughts, to his engagement with the books, <clears throat> some correspondence, not a lot, but it's all interesting, to sources for his novels. And one of the most interesting examples is, for, is that he has his sources for the plot against America filed all in one place, shelved all in one place. So for those of you who want to get into the thinking behind the creation of the novel, there will be an opportunity to look at the books that Roth was perusing during the time that he was creating The Plot Against America. But the Philip Roth Personal Library is not only a place, it's an occasion, an occasion to gather readers, fans, scholars, students, and members of our wider Newark library community to expand all of our thinking, to instill a love of creative thought inspired by Roth's legacy. Now for this call, some of you have submitted questions in advance. All of you have the opportunity to submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. 
So please, as you hear our, part our panelists and moderators speak, if questions occur to you, enter them there using the Q&A function. Our moderator, we are so fortunate to have on this call Peter Sagal, who many of you already love from the weekly Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, which is lifting everybody's spirits in, this, in these times as it does in all times. Thank you, Peter, for joining us tonight. In addition, Peter has been doing a weekly podcast interviewing David Simon as The Plot Against America has been running on HBO. I think you all know that Simon is the producer and Peter and Simon have engaged in conversation exploring some of the themes and some of the choices, I would say, that David Simon made in adapting the book to the series. Uh, so I'd like to welcome everybody for joining us. And I'm going to turn this Zoom conversation over to Peter Sagal. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. And it is a pleasure to be here uh, in support of the work of Philip Roth and, of course, in support of the Newark Public Library. Uh, in addition to what you heard, that I had the good fortune to uh, host or co-host a podcast with David Simon, who created the HBO version, the miniseries, The Plot Against America, meaning that I am not the horse's mouth when it comes to information about the production of the miniseries, but I did spend about 20 hours locked in a room with a horse's mouth so I can provide <laughs> some information, uh, some of which did not make the edited podcast. But in addition, uh, the last time um, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me was in Newark to perform at uh, NIJPAC, New Jersey Performing Arts Center. I walked over to the corner of Broad Street and Springfield Avenue and looked down Springfield Avenue and knew that nine miles due west in Summit, New Jersey is the hospital where I was born. So I am a nice Jewish boy from New Jersey and thus feel <laughs> an heir to Philip Roth's legacy. However, I am also the least knowledgeable person uh, on this screen, on your screen, when it comes to either Philip Roth his work or the history uh, involved in the plot against America. So let me tell you what we're going to do with the actual knowledgeable people. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to ask each of them to speak for about five minutes about their perspective on the work, the miniseries, whatever, the, Mr. Roth himself. And then afterwards, uh, I'll be able to ask them some questions from myself that I'm curious about uh, from the organizers. And then we'll finish the hour with questions from you as as you submit them in the Q&A box, which I've never used before. It's very exciting. So with no further ado, let me introduce our panelists. They are a distinguished series of experts and scholars. We have Mr. Ben Taylor, a writer of fiction and nonfiction. He teaches American literature part-time at Columbia. And he has a book, Here We Are, My Friendship with Philip Roth, coming out in mid-May. We're also joined by Professor Sean Willens, professor of American history at Princeton. He was a friend and guide to Roth in Roth's reading of American history. And he had the honor of being the Philip Roth lecturer at the, Newark, at the Newark Public Library in the fall of last year, which seems a long time ago now. And finally, Fran Bartkowski, professor of English at Rutgers Newark. She teaches Roth's novels, including of course, The Plot Against America in her literature courses. So uh, I believe the phrase is with no further ado, let's start it off with uh, Ben Taylor. Ben, take it away. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> I woke up this morning thinking about certain uh, catastrophic childhoods from which American literature has greatly benefited. Um, uh, the late Robert Stone had a father who was, uh, who, uh, whom he never knew, and a mother who was schizophrenic. Elizabeth Bishop had a father who died when she was five and a mother who went irretrievably insane with grief. Um, Mary McCarthy had uh, uh, a mother and father, both of whom died in the uh, Spanish flu epidemic. She was at six years old, the woman of the house. Um, these uh, 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 fruitful uh, ca catastrophes of childhood um, are not repeated in the life of Philip Roth. Uh, he spoke all often about the lucky accident of a happy childhood. And uh, uh, the more I've looked into the matter, the more I realize he's not glossing over anything. Uh, uh, 
as he sa said to me, the, the balances were right. The, uh, the, the, the four of us together were right. The, the guys up and down the street were right. Uh, this was uh, the American dream coming true, not uh, uh, a, uh, necessarily the likeliest seedbed for art, but uh, it was the seedbed in this case. And uh, I, uh, uh, I think that uh, to understand the plot against America, you have to understand that the experiment uh, was to take this happy childhood, the memory of it, and steep it in the counter historical uh, horrors of a, an America first proto fascist uh, um, Lindbergh presidency. And uh, each night when he went to sleep uh, while writing the book, he would say to himself, don't invent, remember. Don't invent, remember. Uh, uh, that's right so far as it goes, but uh, I've had people ask me, did he, did, did he have a, a cousin Alvin? Did he have a, uh, an Aunt Evelyn? Uh, um, was there a wish now family downstairs? The answer to all those questions is no. What he remembered was the uh, immediate family, uh, but he surrounds them with invention. Uh, uh, remarkable, uh, uh, remarkable cast of characters. Uh, in the version, uh, in the uh, uh, miniseries version, uh, which has so many, there's so many interesting things to say about it. Um, two secondary grotesques, uh, Aunt Evelyn and Rabbi Bengelsdorf, uh, rabbinical windbag in the book. <laughs> Uh, they they uh, they cease to be secondary characters and and get star status. Meanwhile, uh, little Philip, nine, ten, eleven years old, who is the remembering presence of the book, uh, um, uh, be, uh, is rendered almost mute. Though it it's a marvelous child actor they've found, and so much shows on that expressionless face. He's almost like a little Alec Guinness. He can do anything he wants without showing anything on his face. Uh, I'm in awe of that, as I'm always in awe, as I mentioned to my fellow panelists earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of directors who can get these performances for, from children. Uh, 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 it's very memorable. And the young man, uh, let's, is his name Boyle, Anthony Boyle, who plays, uh, yes. it's Andrew Boyle? I, uh, I, I think it's Anthony, but I have, Anthony. would have to check. Who plays Cousin Alvin is obviously going to be a star, a big star. I think he's uh, uh, remarkable. Uh, what I want to uh, conclude with is something from the voice of the novel, which necessarily disappears. It would have been a mistake to do this as a voiceover memory uh, uh, movie, I think. Uh, uh, the, uh, the remembering presence of Philip throughout the book, on every page of the book, is replaced by something more dynamic, something uh, uh, with more drama in it. Uh, and uh, I think that's as it should be. But here is the voice uh, of uh, Philip in the book. He's talking about as the, uh, the threat of this just folks program, which is uh, uh, a, uh, a means of um, removing Jews to the provinces and also of just, uh, and also of uh, creating a discord between Jewish children and their parents. Um, uh, little Philip contemplating all this, a little boy with too little information. He doesn't know very much about politics. He knows nothing yet about sex. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of the the regrettable world of the grown-ups is uh, uh, mysterious to him. And that makes for a lot of the comedy uh, of the book and also the pathos and beauty, extraordinary beauty as in this passage, tinged with the bright after storm light, Summit Avenue was as a gleam with life as a pet. My own silky pulsating pet, washed clean by sheets of falling water and now stretched its full length to bask in the bliss. Nothing 
would ever get me to leave here. Uh, I thank you. I have some, again, some borrowed insight into some of the things that you brought up, the, the change from uh, the, the first person memoir narration of the novel to the multi point of view of the miniseries. But I will say that um, the young actor who plays young Philip, Eji, I got to meet and that kid is already a movie star. He was standing there with a very expensive printed shirt and, and uh, designer frames and just, and just beaming at me. And he knows exactly how good he is. And I can talk more if people are interested about what uh, Mr. Simon told me about those choices. But now, uh, again, let me introduce uh, Professor uh, Sean Willens, who I understand actually helped Philip Roth with his research and has an interesting, I'm told, connection to the <laughs> characters of the story, especially the Lindberghs. Yeah, unfortunately, my, yeah, am I on? I guess you are, Professor, go for it. Um, my family actually turns out, turns up in the book, uh, not always in the most complimentary ways, but I'll get into that in a sec. Um, you know, I'm the historian. So people that were always asking me how much of this is true, how much of this is really historical, how much not. And it's, you know, it's a fantasy, I tell people. This is a historical fantasy. The history is actually quite accurate. And Philip was determined to make sure that was the case. I mean, he asked me, we, we read a lot of history books together as friends. He actually hired an undergraduate student of mine to fact check every single little bit of the book, much of which is, of course, sheer fantasy, but it would have been plausible. You know, it would have been something that Burton K. Wheeler might have said, might have done, even though he didn't. So um, this was very important to him, but it is a fantasy. And it's a fantasy of, of Philip's absolutely ferocious imagination. I mean, he, he, Ben said he invents, he certainly invents, but it's go, it goes beyond invention. Um, the way that he reimagines Walter Winchell, for example, this is, this is Walter Winchell taken to the nth. This is Walter Winchell spun out of control, except under Philip's control the entire time. But it really is, as an historian, you see him take people that you thought you knew well and see him do not a caricature, but a fantasy, a fantasy of what those people might have been doing. And it, it really is quite extraordinary. And now, yes, he and I talked a lot about history. He was a very serious reader of history. And I was thinking the other day about other, what other novelists, American novelists in particular, have, have treated history in the way that, that Philip has, or even treated history at all. Um, I mean, there's a lot of Hawthorne in Philip's writing um, mm -hmm. um, that in a lot of different places. Um, and, and, you know, there's no Faulkner, but Faulkner, of course, and um, I, Tony Morrison, beloved. But, but there are a few that stand out. Um, Philip's very different, though. I mean, each of those, interestingly, is particular. Hawthorne is about Puritanism. Faulkner is about Mississippi, the South, all of that, whole history behind it. Um, beloved's about a particular, but it's about the slave experience. Philip is certainly talking about the Jews in Newark, but he's talking about America in a much bigger way, I think. And, and, and that makes him very special, I think maybe singular in the history of American writing. I'm gonna, I wanna know the people who know a lot more about writing than I do. But, but from an historian standpoint, I look out for this and it really is quite singular in the way that he goes about imagining all of that. Um, the, the point of it, as you know, I mean, Apparently, Philip read one day in, in, in Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s memoir, um, Arthur noted that at one point, some Republicans thought about nominating Lindbergh um, you know, for the presidency. And that stopped him cold, and he started, his imagination went to work. Um, in doing that, he tells a story that is not at all a parable. And I, this is something that I always have to discourage people from, from, from seeing it as. It's not about George W. Bush. It's certainly not a premonition of Donald Trump. It is a story about, as, as Ben was saying, he wants to go back to that family, that loving family, and imagine what would have happened if America itself had not been America. America kind of got very lucky in the 1930s. You know, we, we think about it, it was really uh, alone in the world and not going to the, to the high uh, right wing. Um, America was lucky to have FTR. But it was surrounded by lots of other things. Lindbergh was only part of it. There was the Huey Long movement in, in, um, uh, in Louisiana. There's Father Coughlin, who actually turns up in the book. But there's a whole miasma of weird 
crazy politics that were going swirling around. And what Philip has done is to take those, um, take that miasma and put it to the center of things and see how his family developed in the midst of all of that. It's a very personal story, but it's history rewritten in that particular way. Um, so don't, don't be looking for the present. It's very much about the past. But within that, there are archetypes which you know, resound in the present as well. Um, and, and here's where I think his, his portrayal, not only of people like Winchell, the secondary character, but somebody like, like Lindbergh. Um, Lindbergh is a, the book's about America in a fundamental way, okay? And there are two Americas you get here. There's the America that I think of as most brilliantly evoked in the trip to Washington um, when, when they're driving along. And then, and then young Philip first sees the Capitol building. Now, he sees it and he sees American history, you know, this great white building. It is America. It is the America that, 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 that in the end, will, 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 we hope will redeem itself. So, so that's very much there. It's very, very strong. And yet, Lindbergh's also America. Someone once, uh, towards the end, end of Philip's life, someone once asked him, in fact, was he thinking about Trump? Was he prefiguring Trump? And compared to Trump, he said, no, Trump, I mean, Lindbergh was a genuine hero. And that's part of the importance of all of this. He really was. He was an aeronautical genius. He was a real hero. He was an American type. He was Gary Cooper with the cowlick. He was all of those things. That too is America. In a sense, the two are being posed against each other. The Capitol building, who's going to win out in all of this? But Lindbergh was not Trump. Trump's, a, you know, as he said, is a capitalist con man compared to, 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 to Lindbergh. Um, it's a very different type that would, have, that would have been thrown up in the novel. So what you see, I think, is here, there are a lot of things going on here. There's the family. But as far as history is concerned, I think we're being, Philip is making us confront the fact that, well, things did, did, would, wouldn't necessarily turn out the way that, the, that, that they were supposed to. In other words, we live on this very, very, um, 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 what, gossamer-like um, reality that can change at any minute. You never know when it's going to change. He talks about history, the relentless unforeseen in history, that we think about history as something that happened the way it ought to have happened. Everything happened because it was supposed to happen, when in, when in fact we're living through things that are completely unforeseen at all times. That is, I think, at the bottom of all of this, and where America is going to go between the Capitol building, if you will, and that everything it represents, and Lindbergh, it could go either way. It could go either way. And, and I think that he wanted us to see that. In the end, we get, a, you know, everything gets redeemed. Mrs. Lindbergh turns out to be someone quite extraordinary. FDR is brought back to the presidency. Everything is fine. And you kind of think at the end of it, well, did all of that actually happen maybe while I was sleeping and we went through this whole experience? The point is to see that we can go, America, both of these Americas exist and we can go towards either one of them in a nuts. And that's something that's both um, um, very frightening, um, but, but, but something that I think brings us back actually to the character of Herman, because it is possible for one person to stand up and do things. It's not only, it can be scary, but you can have a place, you can have a, 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 um, um, a place in determining where the country is going to go, but you can't control it. And you never know what you're going to be thrown up against. And one always has to be prepared. And so, I'll leave that at that. We can talk more about history as we go along. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I'm actually very curious in our conversation later to talk a little bit about the ending from, of the book, which yeah. I don't think it's a spoiler for tonight's final episode, is, is different than the ending that David Chim Simon chose uh, for the miniseries, which I guess to give it away is a little bit more ambiguous. But uh, as for now, Fran, you're up. Okay, well, I hope everyone will bear with me. I'm going to read um, and it's five minutes, okay? Um, so the context is the following. In the fall of 2005, I taught a course for the English department at Rutgers University, Newark, called the Post-9-11 Novel. It was Philip Roth's most recent novel, published in 2004. And it was where we began our study of how writers took this cataclysmic event in American life and history and turn to fiction to metabolize our unprecedented collective trauma. 
Now we know that this turn to, we know that this event happened for Americans and all global citizens in ways inflected by where they lived, how they voted, what they believed, and what the wars that followed in Afghanistan and Iraq meant to them. In this undergraduate class in Newark, New Jersey, many of our students had been on campus that Tuesday, four years earlier. And some of our students had lost family and friends who worked or lived across the river. To approach this novel, we took comfort in the fact of the past where the novel was set, 1940, a time remote from my undergraduates, cushioned Cush uh, that time remote for our undergraduates cushioned our dive into this dystopia or alternate history. For it is, as genres go, one might say a dystopian fiction, an imaginary world figured out of history into a fictive past. It's a realist narrative that turns dystopian as members of the Roth family begin to deal with the way that the world they have known and which has comforted and supported them through family and neighborhood, school and work, begins to turn into an unrecognizable constellation of forces that spin siblings, cousins, parents, and neighbors with centrifugal force into oppositional relations unforeseen and unreadable to the narrator, young Philip. As someone who had been reading Roth for many years, this voice and the narrator of the plot was new for Roth, a young boy trying to make sense of why his closest kin were becoming enemies in their positions about the presidential election that pitted Franklin Delano Roosevelt against Charles Lindbergh. My students knew some about Roosevelt from American history classes in high school or college. About Lindbergh, if they knew his name, it was in the context of his famous flight across the Atlantic before his family became known for the kidnapping of his child and they certainly were unaware of his sympathies with the Third Reich. In the fall of 2005, as we read the novel and posed the question of why Roth might have turned to this fictive time in America when he did, we could discern how the Jews of Newark might be seen as a prism for the way that Muslims in America became subjects of suspicion, objects of xenophobia, and we all had to learn that Islamophobia was the name for what in the plot is driven by anti-Semitism in the late 1930s. Roth has been a diagnostician and artist of how hatred can foment change before our eyes. He turned readers' attention to some of these issues when he edited the series of translations of Eastern European writers published for the first time in America in the 1970s. And certainly in his own novels and short stories, he often turned the lens on the Jewish community with its divided loyalties to orthodoxy, Israel, class consciousness, progressive politics, and the 20th century politics of assimilation of ethnic and religious differences into the American mosaic. In the fall of 2017, I had already decided in a syllabus for contemporary American fiction to begin with a series of dystopian novels. First up was Roth's plot, which begged to be reread in the year after the election of our 45th president. How could I ever have imagined that two weeks before the semester began, we would all be shocked and traumatized by events on the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia, where white supremacy and neo-Nazis were on the march and where protester to, protesters against them were attacked and one young woman, Heather Heyer, was killed by this mob surge of hatred. I had trepidations about what it would mean to leap into this fiction with so much real zealotry on view. Once again, Roth's writing took us into the mind of a young boy trying to make sense of what was making the young and older adults around him enemies in the hearth and home. Roth was acute at inhabiting the space of confusion for this Philip in the face of politics arriving at the door and on movie screens and on the radio, putting his beloved parents at odds with each other 
how his aunt, the fiance and wife of the most prominent Jew in Lindbergh's circle was able to do favors for her nephews who wanted only to feel safe again as they had before the speeches and newsreels made them targets in new ways, open ways that brought shame and fear where before Philip could admire his older brother and cousin. Our task in both these classes through the reading of Roth's novel was to aim to understand how quickly cultural and political climates could change. As we had watched happen in 2001 and then in 2016-17, when my students were all too aware of how differences had become divisive. This teaching at a university known to have the most diverse student body in the US couldn't have been more important work to do for we are all still living a fever dream that Roth gives us full blown in the plot against America. Um, and just as I've long been an, an admirer of Roth and teacher of Roth, I'll just say Peter and Ben and Sean, I have twice taught on our campus, David Simon's HBO, The Wire. Yes. <laughs> the classes of a hundred students. So David Simon and Philip Roth coming together, I couldn't wait for this. And I really do think Simon is in top form in this series. I, I got to ask teaching in Newark, what went over better, the wire or the plot against America? They both went over well in very different, you know, plot I taught in a literature class. Sure. Wire went over differently. The first time we did it was 2013. Some students really had been watching it and were watching it anew for learning to be able to talk about it. By 2016, when we taught it again, it was kind of a distant memory. And I think if we were to do it now, they would all have to go back to that drawing board. I don't know yeah. that anybody, even though it's out there on HBO anytime you want it, I don't know who's watching The Wire now, except if they become you know, a fan of David Simon and they want to see where he started out before homicide. I'll say briefly that if anybody out there doesn't, has, hasn't watched The Wire, which was David Simon's not <laughs> first, but his seminal work, you can watch it for free via HBO, thanks to them during the coronavirus lockdown. So enjoy. Um, like I said, uh, I've got a few questions for our panel, uh, as do our organizers, and I'll go through them for about 15, 20 minutes. And I guess I'll make it a, a free-for-all, rather, since there's only uh, three of you. Uh, let me start, although I will ask uh, Ben about this, because I think that you had the closest relationship with Ben, with, with Mr. Roth personally. I could be wrong, but I'll assume that and ask um, this, I, I, I'm far from a completist with the Roth canon, but even so, I've encountered different versions of his mother and father and brother in different books. Um, is this version, the Herman and Sandy and Bess of plot, the most accurate? Is that what his parents were really like, as far as we know? Uh, I, I pitched that to Ben, who is currently muted. Sorry. It's okay. Um, you know, I, I think he was, um, he wrote two uh, works of autobiography, one <laughs> called Facts, in which he tried not to transform anything, and then another uh, masterpiece uh, uh, of a memoir called Patrimony, about mm. the, die, the long dying of his father. Yeah. Uh, and then this book, which is a, a strange sort of uh, autobiography that takes the, uh, the truth of the Roth family and uh, plunges it into dystopic circumstances. Uh, so I think that uh, 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 reading those three books, you get a very uh, clear picture of uh, what the work ethic was in that household. He was very proud of his parents. Uh, proud of their uh, Americanization. Uh, also, he, he insisted that they weren't immigrant Jews, that they were American Jews, that his grandparents had been immigrant Jews, but uh, that ended with them. And the, um, the speed with which uh, people from other places, whether from Asia or Europe, uh, 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 shed an old identity and, and uh, uh, acquire a new one. This is one of the greatest American stories. It's, it's, it's the story Willa Cather is telling in her novels about uh, 
Swedes and Czechs and, and uh, other people on the prairie. It's the story that the Jewish American writers are telling, Bello and Malamut and Roth and others. Uh, and uh, uh, I think there was considerable pride in who they were. Also, he, f he felt that uh, that rarest of things, a familial concord had been won. The pr that prize had been won by the Roth family. Uh, he, uh, uh, he had no idea how little money they had, for example, growing up, uh, how few frills. Philip did not know what an artichoke was until he left home. Uh, <laughs> and uh, 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 Mrs. William F. Buckley said to him um, at a dinner party, uh, uh, what's your background? And he responded, uh, uh, I didn't have one, we were too poor. <laughs> <laughs> but he was extraordinarily proud of what his parents had achieved. Uh, do either do Fran or Sean want to chime in well, on that question? I just wonder, I was wondering about, I mean, Herman comes across in both in the book and in the, even perhaps even more in the, in the HBO series, really he's a heroic figure, right? I mean, mm -hmm. he's one who's, as all the stuff is happening, he's the one who's saying, wait, stop, it's happening, it's happening. And he stands up and gets beaten up and all the rest of it. Is that a projection though, that he would have, did he think of his father as a hero, Ben, in quite that way? Um, I think he thought of his father as a nudge and a shrew a lot of the time. Okay. <laughs> this, father, this father was somebody he had to fight with and flee from before right. he could venerate him. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, Fran, go ahead, please. Yeah, just two things. Um, I kept remembering a phrase I love, and I think, Ben, it's from patrimony, not the facts, but maybe you could correct me. Ross says somewhere, I was her Philip and his wrath about his parents and their love for him. And I've always just been very taken with the way that divides up parental love and care and what that relationship suggested. But my second thing, you read that beautiful quote when you were doing your presentation about the street and what it looks like. It's after rain. Yeah, I wonder, Peter, do you know, I feel like this is David Simon's most idealized urban setting we've yeah. ever seen. Yes. Where is the grit of Baltimore or New Orleans or Yonkers or Times Square? Do you have any, does anybody? I, I, I have a, a, a little bit of insight. And again, it's, it's borrowed. It's borrowed from Mr. Simon, David, um, that yes, this is not, East Baltimore, and this ain't 42nd Street from his more recent show, The Deuce. It's not even New Orleans, which a city he loves and lives in part time. Um, one of the things that you said, Ben, about this generation of Jews, even though, of course, David's uh, in his late 50s is much younger than Philip Roth, he very much identified Herman Roth with his own father, David's father. In fact, in tonight's final episode, uh, mm -hmm. the character of Herman has a line, which I guess I can give away. The line is he's looking at a sandwich and he says, bologna and mayonnaise on white bread. What are they, trying to kill us? <laughs> <laughs> and that line is not in the book. The book line was something that David's own father said in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation which was quite remarkable and I won't give away. So one of the things that David talked a lot about was how much the Roths in their world reminded him of his own background growing up in uh, the, the, actually the Washington suburbs, not Baltimore. He grew up in, I think, Silver Spring. And, and he feels a real affection toward his own home and his own background. Uh, and I think he extended that affection to the Roths, or rather I should say the Levins in their world. And by the way, to answer a question people might have, um, David Simon did meet with Philip Roth uh, prior to obviously to Roth's death and, and prior to the production of the miniseries. And Roth apparently basically made one request to him in terms of the adaptation, which is that he changed the name of the family from Roth to Levin because he felt when I'm writing about my family, I, I, I you know, can control what I say about them. I don't want you, an artist to whom he was giving complete freedom to say things about Herman Roth, Bess Roth, Philip Roth, Sandy Roth, that Philip may or may not have agreed with. That's why the name was changed. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, I also want to ask about something that is changed in the miniseries, which is its depiction of characters 
Jewish characters of the time in rather unpleasant ways. One of the most significant differences in the miniseries in the book is the character of Alvin. Uh, when Alvin comes back from the war with his leg blown off, he goes down a dark road and stays there. Um, and it's not a very pleasant outcome for that character. Uh, there are other characters in the book, the, the, the big macher, the racetrack, Steiner, the racetrack owner or operator. These are unpleasant grasping people. And I wonder how you scholars of Roth, friends of Roth, see that as fitting into his own view of like the Jewish character. Because as we also know, Roth got some grief, I think even as he says from his own family and certainly the Jewish community for the way he depicted Jews in his earlier works like Goodbye Columbus, oh, excuse me, not Goodbye Columbus, Portnoy's Complaint. You, you know, Saul used to say, uh, 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 literature is not uh, an exercise in public relations. Uh, <laughs> and uh, to uh, make the Jews palatable for Gentile consumption, it was as far as possible from the aims uh, of any of these real Jewish American artists that we have now, who were the uh, perhaps the dominant force in the uh, post-war period in, in American fiction, uh, uh, culminating in Philip's uh, masterpieces of the 1990s, which we're talking about, uh, 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 I think, 2000, it's 2004, right? Yeah, he I believe so. He starts yeah. this book in 1999. Uh, I remember, I do remember a dinner when I was first getting to know Philip. This would have been about this would have been 2001, and he said, I've got a magnificent idea for a novel. Uh, and I said, well, tell me. He said, no, absolutely not. I can't tell anyone. Uh, <laughs> and that was the, uh, the earliest stage. Uh, uh, he, as someone, someone has mentioned, he was reading a, a bound galley of Arthur Schlesinger's memoirs in which Schlesinger reports that somebody on the Republican side had the idea of nominating uh, uh, Lindbergh. Yeah. Uh, and Philip wrote in the margin, in the margin uh, uh, what if they had? And this was the uh, germ uh, of this formidable idea for a counter historical novel. Did he, ever, uh, did he ever feel any responsibility or even a rejection of the responsibility to depict Jews in a positive or negative light? No, that was the, no. Furthest, the furthest thing no. from his mind. Yeah. Yeah, Not so at all. <laughs> I mean, in, the, in the book, and this is where my family comes in. I mean, there's an attorney that in the book, I don't know if it's going to show up in the, in the series at all, but Attorney General David Willans shows up in the, in the novel. And he's, and he's one of the court Jews. He's one of the Jews who goes to Bengals, the Bengelsdorf's wedding. And he lists them all. And it's really yeah. killing. And, 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 and he makes a point of when there's Walter Winchell on the one hand, and then there are the court Jews on the other. And, and, and um, unfortunately, David Willans is one of them. He, uh, he, later, he later somewhat redeems himself. But I don't think that Philip had any idea. He, he, they were Jews and they were Jews and lots of different people. First of all, the very idea that there was a thing called the Jews would have, would have made him laugh very, very hard. Um, but I think he, he, was, he, he understood nuances. He understood why people were doing what they were doing. Um, there was a Jewish, what, inflection and in all of that. There were, there were certainly Jewish people, but the idea that he was going to either glorify or, 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 or make fun of, no, that wasn't, that wasn't his interest at all. I can remember his saying oh, once, uh, 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 would you have wanted James Joyce to re uh, represent the Irish in an entirely favorable light? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Did, didn't he in fact get a lot of grief back in the 60s when Portnoy's complaint came out because uh, came out that people were like, oh my God, you're making us look like this terrible, you know, neurotic, person abusing liver. This is it, bad for it the wasn't. Jews. <laughs> even, before. even before Portnoy. Yeah. It, it was in, uh, uh, with the Defender of the Faith when it right. appeared. Oh, in, yes. Uh, uh, yes, rabbis from their pulpits were saying, what can be done to silence this man? <laughs> uh, Fran, did you want to chime in on this? Well, I, just that, you know, I didn't read Portnoy's complaint for a very long time as a feminist of the second wave, even though I had read Goodbye Columbus and some other Roth, there was a way that he, he kind of got put on the back burner for me for a long time. And when I did get around to reading Portnoy's complaint, which I have not taught and would not teach, but you know, there was a lot of laughing aloud <laughs> to that book. 
Um, and somewhere along the way, I did write a piece about, you know, a feminist reads Philip Roth because I, you know, not only did I teach plot, but there was a semester where I taught a course to our advanced English majors on Toni Morrison and Philip Roth, where we read four of each of their novels, because I think, you know, a master of the sentence of late 20th century, early 21st century American English, both of them. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Philip, go ahead, please. Philip once said uh, 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 that the, the, the um, the Jews are uh, not no worse than any other people. Better than that, I cannot say of them. <laughs> Such pride. Um, right. This is a question that has already popped up, I think, four times in the Q&A from our audience. It's something okay. the organizers are curious, and myself as well. So let's get to it. And that is Rabbi Bengelsdorf. Many people here, including myself, are fascinated by Rabbi Bengelsdorf. As has already been said, he's somewhat of a, of, a, of a supporting character in the novel. In the TV series, he's a major character played by the brilliant John Turturro, who has played so many Jews in his career that he basically counts as Jewish by now. Um, and so the, let, let's start with this question. Is, and I guess I'll go to you, Sean, is he based on anyone real? Or is he a composite? Is he a complete invention? Do you know? Oh, I think that's an invention. I don't, there's no historical figure who sticks out. Um, a, a, a South Carolina Southern Jewish um, supporter of Lindbergh's? No, you don't, you, you don't see that. It is important that he's Southern. I mean, it's very, very important that in, in, the, in the series, I can't remember if this is in the book or not, but there's a whole scene where he's talking about how great the South is actually pretty, pretty all right. And, um, and he mentions Judah Benjamin, you know. Yeah. Oh, that is in the book. Chariot of the Treasury. And, and, you know, and, 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 you know, it was okay. So there you see he's, he's, he's taking the tradition of America that is the most, what should we say, repellent, and he's combining it. And that's the, that's the side that, that Bengelsdorf is embracing. Now, so the fact that he's a Southerner is really, truly important in, in, in that depiction. But I don't think that he's an historical cognate particularly. It is a composite of, 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 of his own imagination. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a virtuous rabbi also in the book, Rabbi Prince, and I, yes. don't, I don't think he's in the series. So Bengelsdorf in the book is counterbalanced by a, an, a, an anti-fascist rabbi, Rabbi Prince. And, and you are, not, and you are, and, I think and he rabbi was very Prince, real. He was a very oh, real character. Rabbi, rabbi Prince was, a, oh. was a yeah. And, and in fact, one of the questions in the audience was whether, saying with some fear that Bengelsdorf might have been based on Prince, which would have been a calumny on Prince. Uh, no, as you say, Prince appears in the book in his real guise. Yes. Fran, please. Just to say, I was reminded as I've been listening to the book on Audible, you know, there's a beautiful documentary about Joachim Prince called I Shall Not Be Silent. Um, and, you know, Prince spoke uh, after Aretha Franklin at the March on Washington, which is why we don't hear about him very much, but he was one of the speakers. And he's an amazing figure who, you know, told his congregants in Berlin, leave now, and ends up in Newark and is the rabbi who, when the uprising happens in 67, is begging his congregation not to leave Newark. I mean, it's a, it's a circling round that's kind of a phenomenal story, O oh, King Prince. Um, let me ask a couple more questions of my own. We'll finish with the remaining questions I'm seeing in the Q&A. Let's talk about the ending, which you referred to. And as I said, that's one of the things that David Simon changed with Philip Roth's permission. Um, Philip Roth basically said, it, it's actually the, the story that David tells is, he goes to Philip Roth, uh, he says, um, you know, I'd like to make a particular change, which you'll see in tonight's episode. Is that all right with you? And Roth said, go ahead, it's your problem. <laughs> um, but the, the ending, you can tell, didn't say, well, David Sonny, as we've discussed, the ending is the, all the events of the novel pass away as if it was a dream. And well, history returns mm -hmm. to its normal course. FDR right. becomes president. Uh, Pearl Harbor is attacked, albeit somewhat later, the war proceeds. And Roth, writing from the perspective of the quote unquote present, seems to describe an American history that more or less took its own course, or rather its natural course. Do you guys have any insight as to why Roth made that choice? Why Roth decided after invoking this nightmare that as you say, Professor, could easily have happened, 
why he decided to erase it and, and give in a weird way the readers an out by saying, no, 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 it was all bad dream and everything's, mm -hmm. everything went back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I could answer that from what was on Philip's mind, why, why he decided to do that. I can only tell you what my reaction is. Please. And, and my reaction is that, again, it has to do with this uncertainty and this flip, these flips that, occur, that can occur in history. Mm -hmm. history. Have these jags, these sudden leaps that you're never certain of. And just as he got us into all of that mess, the flip brings us out of it as well. I mean, there was no way, for example, at least in the novel, where you can see Anne Morrow Lindbergh rising to the occasion as she does to change history. That is something that was unpredictable. It was, again, the relentless unforeseen, but I think he wanted to do it, he wanted to flip it back to show just how powerful that was. That's the way I read it. Um, not to make you feel better, not at all. Maybe there's a little bit of hope in it, you know, when things are at their bleakest, perhaps things can turn the other way. But I think he was re-accentuating that, that aspect of the novel throughout. But I'm curious to see what my, my colleagues have to say about that. By all means. Uh, Fram, why not you, if you have some thoughts? Well, um, <clears throat> I, you know, when I first read about the series, there was mention that Simon changes the ending, okay? I don't know what he's done, and none of us do, except you probably do, Peter. Oh, I do, uh, but I'm not telling. Right, <laughs> I don't tell. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there is that stunning moment in the novel where it's suddenly over, right? Um, and the, the fever dream is over. Um, but then we get that whole, where is Lindbergh, right? Mm -hmm. That series of um, ways of taking on what has happened here and how the hell do we come back from this to what? You know, there, there's a way that, 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 that hinge, that turning point, that change really sets readers on, on their heels about how do you go with this book? How do you stay with this book? What is the author asking of you, you know? I mean, I, I, I always tell my students, a good writer turns you into the reader they want you to be. And I think this is a moment where Roth is asking a lot of us in terms of, you've come with me this far? Okay, now here's this, now see this, now read this. Um, it, it's a big ask, I would say. Yeah. Ben, do you have any thoughts about the ending? Uh, uh, I'm impressed re reading through the, uh, the book this time by uh, the magisterial presence of the Roosevelt's uh, uh, in isolation at, uh, at Hyde Park following this unimaginable defeat. Nobody in the weak quake section could ever have imagined that Franklin Roosevelt would lose an election. He was their protector. Uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the moment right at the geometric center of the book when FDR emerges from isolation and makes a public speech and says, speaks about a plot being hatched by anti-democratic forces at home, harboring a Quisling blueprint mm. for a fascist America. Uh, that's FDR calling a spade a spade and the reemergence of great leadership in this uh, 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 nightmare. Uh, and then at the end of the book, yes, FDR resumes the presidency as if this had all been uh, a dream. Yeah, yeah, it's very hard to say. Um, we have just a few um, questions from the audience. Uh, many of them, like I said, were really interested in Rabbi Bengelsdorf. I'll, one of the things you'll hear if you listen to the podcast is how much David Simon, who with his writing partner, Ed Burns, created in essence, the Rabbi Bengelsdorf of the series, since he's so much more in the series than in the book, how much he related uh, Bengelsdorf to the fabled figure of Romkowski, right. who of course was the leader of the Jews in the Lodz ghetto, I believe, and is famous. I mean, really he's almost passed into myth as the Jew who collaborated with the Nazis insofar as encouraging his families eventually to pick one child to be sent to the camps to save the other. And who, went, of course, ended up for all his, known as the King of the Jews, who ended up for all his attempts to accommodate being sent as one of the last trains. That's, that was Simon's inspiration for 
And we talk a lot in the podcast about how Bengelsdorf feels he can protect himself by, prox uh, by his proximity to power and, and how that could be quite natural and human. Um, there's a question uh, for me, I'll, I'll briefly answer it. And it was a discussion of, of, of a scene, again, invented for the miniseries in which Al Alvin, overseas in London, is in bed with a girl. And the girl, who's probably never met a Jew before, asks him how he can be Jewish if he doesn't believe in God. I mean, isn't Judaism religion? And I, as I say to David in the podcast, really like that because that's a question I've been asked. I'm not particularly religious yet. I'm strongly identify as a Jew. And, and uh, Alvin's answer is basically, I'm a Jew because my father was a Jew and his father was a Jew and his father was a Jew. And all through history, they've been trying to get rid of us and we ain't going anywhere. And that I thought was, that was that's, it spoke well for me. It obviously speaks well for Simon. I wonder if you, as scholars and friends of Roth, think it spoke for Roth or if Roth might have agreed with that, even though it wasn't his speech. I'm all for adaptations that take these liberties because a, um, the a novel is a, a, an experience of slow revelation. Uh, I guess a miniseries can, can be that too. But uh, so much is, so, so much in movies is about, well, faces, for instance, the unforgettable faces in this miniseries. Uh, Whereas when you read a novel, you don't really need to know exactly what anybody's face looks like. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm all for departures. And uh, uh, it, did, it did seem to me uh, n not unrothian what uh, Alvin said in bed with that girl. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm a Jew. In fact, uh, he says something nearly like that at the end of, uh, of The Counter Life. I'm a Jew not because of any doctrine. Uh, I'm a Jew because of uh, a, a heredity that binds me back to the past. Mm -hmm. But that's the, that's the root meaning of the word religious, right? To be bound back, religiare. And um, uh, that, that doesn't sound unrothian to me. Either of you, Sean or, or Fran, want to comment on that? Yeah, I think, I think Ben's right. I think Ben's right. Mm -hmm. It's, not, it's nice to see Alvin. Alvin is a whole new character. I mean, I, you know, in, in, in the miniseries. So, um, um, you know, it, 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 it was nice to be able to see what that might have looked like if Philip, you know, decided to change the, the, uh, the, the perspective a little bit. Um, I got to really like him, even though he gets, as he descends into his darkness. Um, I think this is, you know, the you know, as, as, as Ben is saying, it's creativity departure. This is all to David Simon's credit. I mean, you know, those yeah. characters are, are really do come alive. It's a it's a very tragic story within the novel. A a, a high-minded young man who becomes uh, uh, one of the neighborhood crumb bums. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um, you know, he's such a he's so driven by impulse, Alvin. He's like a character who acts on impulse. And um, that moment where the nurse and he have that conversation, it's as if he's being asked to think about a question bigger than the way he tends to frame yes. any yeah. kind of questions he ever has. Um, and that he goes to this kind of thousand years of, you know, multi-thousand years of patriarchy is just, you know, it's so handy yeah. and so true in a certain way. So I, I would agree with Ben, not unrothian, um, right. but definitely a kind of window into Alvin that's different from what we get in the book. Uh, as you may know, my tradition is to end with a lightning round. So uh -huh. I'll ask you guys a very quick question for reasons that you, I'm sure all of you know more about than I am, despite his genius and his acclaim, Roth's works have rarely been adapted. So... Mm -hmm. Now that they've done the plot against America, what Roth novel would you, the three of you, like to see adapted by HBO, say, into a premium miniseries? <laughs> ben? Uh, uh, the answer is inevitable. It's Nemesis, his final work. Okay. Mm -hmm. which, is about an epidemic, which is about an epidemic. Oh, well. Uh, oh, right. 
Fran? Uh, Lightning round. I would love to see the human stain done better. Yeah, yeah. I knew you were going to say oh, that. Oh, my goodness. That was so not uh, up to par. Yeah. Uh, it's such a beautiful, it's a masterpiece. And Sean? Well, they've just taken the two that I was going to mention, but I'll mention one just to give a plug for a novel that often is overlooked, and that's the great American novel. Yes, uh, that, sir, is the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What's my prize, Peter? No, well, I, your, your prize is you have my admiration. I have been telling people about that book literally for 30 years since I found wow. a copy of it. Oh, and it's, it's my favorite novel about baseball. It's the, I think it's oh. one of the funniest novels ever written. It's amazing. Any book with a character named Gil Gamesh is yes. awesome. <laughs> beyond, beyond, beyond. But, but it's also a novel that actually reminds me a lot of Plot Against America. When I was trying to think of what else in Roth, I mean, it, it is about America and it's all its zaniness. It is Philip at his most as I say, his, his Rabelaisian, maybe that's the wrong term, but his mm. imagination running wild. Mm. That's what you see with real historical characters. It's, the novel's actually based on a baseball team called the Cleveland Spiders. You would never know that because he, worst team in, in all of Amer recorded history. Um, what he does with that is extraordinary. So I'd yeah. love to. So I'll just say this to the audience. You should all read the great American novel and then we'll all petition HBO to make that next. Yes. Uh, it has been an absolute delight for me to talk to all three of you uh, about Roth, about this book and this miniseries, which I have the most fortunate connection. I have no credibility, but I just stumbled into involvement with this wonderful project. It's a pleasure to be here. But to wrap up the afternoon, it is my pleasure to hand the, the I guess, imaginary microphone back to Tom Auritz from the Library Committee. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. On behalf of the library, I want to expand a special thanks to our panel this evening, Sean Wilentz from Princeton, Fran Bartkowski from Rutgers Newark, and Ben Taylor, one of Philip's best friends and author of the forthcoming book, Here We Are, to be published this spring and documenting their relationship. And a special thanks to our guest moderator, Peter Sagal from NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Thanks to the Newark Public Library Foundation trustees and staff who planned and executed this event, especially to our president, Rosemary Steinbaum. Thanks to all of you for attending the event. I hope that you enjoyed our program, learned a little more about the Philip Roth Personal Library at the Newark Public Library, and that you'll be joining us in supporting the creation of the room as we enter our construction year. Take a sip of your cocktail, like my Wequaic Quarantini, <laughs> with the final episode of HBO's Plot Against America, and plan on joining us in about a year for the opening of the Philip Roth Personal Library at the Newark Public Library. So long for now. Hope to see you at the library soon, and have an enjoyable evening savoring the final episode of Plot Against America. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you all for being here. Yeah. Thank you all to the panelists Thank as well. You. That was really Thank enjoyable. Bye-bye. Take care. Be well, everybody. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stay safe. Bye-bye.